now it is. <laughs> yep. Yeah, um, I have, I guess, the privilege of, in a very short time, getting to introduce Marlos twice. Um, it was only like five, five weeks ago, I think he was he was with us, maybe six weeks, something like that, uh, giving us uh, an AI seminar. Um, and now back to talk about a topic that I teased. Uh, I wasn't allowed to tell you about it, but now uh, we get Marlos back uh, to talk about the um, very cool results out of his work with Google Brain. And I also uh, get the privilege of maybe not being the first time uh, I get to introduce, well, it's the first time I get to introduce Marlos where his affiliation is now with DeepMind. Um, he has joined uh, DeepMind uh, Alberta um, and uh, is also an adjunct professor at the University of Alberta. Um, so these are two things I'm very excited about and uh, excited to hear Marlos' talk today. Go ahead, Marlos. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, I'm going to sh start sharing my screen. Um, can people see my slides? And I need someone to say something because I'm not seeing anyone. Yes. Yeah. OK. Uh, so yes, I'm really happy to be back. I thought that this talk was the perfect excuse to actually make the announcement that I'm back in Alberta, that now I'm at DeepMind Alberta. Um, and yes, as Mike said, uh, this was teased before. So I, I wanted to come back and also talk about this. Um, as I as as I said, I'm not seeing anyone. So if you raise your hand, if you make bad faces, I'm not seeing it. So please shout out when you have a question. Um, and today I'm going to talk about autonomous navigation of stratospheric balloons using reinforcement. Uh, this is a work that I did uh, while I was at Google Brain in Montreal, um, and it was a, a collaboration with Loom. The from the brain side, the work was done with uh, also with Mark Belma, Pablo Castro, and Ziyu Wang. And in Loom, we were working with Sal Candido, Jun Gong, and Sam Conde. And basically, if I get disconnected, if you get bored, then your connection goes out and you just want to uh, leave. This is the one pager summary of the talk, uh, which is the result that. It's, what we are reporting in what I'm going to talk about today, which is this paper that we had accepted Nature uh, last month, is the is what we are reporting the deployment of reinforcement learning in the real world, where we actually designed a deep reinforcement learning algorithm that uh, was used that is used to control balloons in the stratosphere. And the plan for my talk today is to go over these things with you. Okay. So the roadmaps that I'm going to spend some time talking about the, the problem set up, uh, some, some of the motivation behind this. Then I'm going to try to be a little bit more formal and present what the problem actually is that we solved, how we modeled the problem, and, and how we approached it from a reinforcement learning perspective. And then I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about results, both in simulation and also the deployment uh, in the real world. OK? And feel free to shout out at any time questions. It's going to be good because at least I'm, I'm going to know that there's someone on the other side. I'm just seeing my, my slides. So let me start with the, the motivation and, and the, the problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, when you think about uh, internet and how people have access to internet, it's generally through cell towers uh, spread around, the, let's say, a city. And a cell tower, it has, it can serve a region of approximately six kilometers, uh, which is great for densely populated regions, if you think about that, because there is a lot of people in a, in a radius of six kilometers. That's, that's quite big. And, and that's how, I guess, pretty much all of us get our internet uh, these days. The problem, though, is that there are a lot of places that are very sparsely populated. And there are not that many people around this, this region of, let's say, six, uh, this, uh, this circle of six, uh, the six kilometers radius. And not only that, but sometimes it's even hard to get to, this, to these regions, right? Imagine that you want to build a cell tower in the middle of the Amazon forest to provide internet to, to natives uh, in the forest. It's just like, it's difficult to get there and to, and to build the tower. So there is both the fact that it's hard to get there. And it's also the econo economic incentives sometimes are not aligned. And how do how, how one way to solve this problem 
is to have a very, very, very tall cell tower, uh, a cell tower that is maybe 20 kilometers tall. And if you have that, then you can serve a much bigger region. Of course, the problem is that we don't know how to build cell towers that are 20 kilometers tall. Uh, but Loon had this idea of uh, having balloons uh, stationing on their stratosphere, and the balloons would provide the internet. And this was uh, the original setup and the motivation that we had when we started working with them uh, in this project. The problem then is that we want the, the balloons to be in a, a fixed in, in, in a specific position, which is the region that you want to serve internet, right? And there is a catch, though. The problem is that these balloons, they do not have propellers. The only way that they, na that they, they navigate in the, in the stratosphere is by sailing the winds. So basically, uh, when you look at the, uh, uh, when you go, see, go to the stratosphere, you have winds blowing at different altitudes. Blow, winds are blowing at different directions. And all that the balloons can do is to decide to go up or down. And once they do that, uh, if the balloon goes up and the wind is blowing in a different direction, the, the balloon is going to sail the winds, and that's uh, how you can control the position of these balloons, right? Um, this is a cartoonish this depiction of the problem. It's actually much more higher, higher dimensional, uh, like even in the number of levels, let's say, that you have different uh, wind currents, but also in the directions of the winds, of course. But here you get a sense that let's say that you want to serve one of these mountains, uh, you see that the balloon gets up to the mountain, and if the balloon wants, it can go up and then go down again, and then you know that the balloon is within that region for an extended period of time, and this is the general idea and the problem that uh, we wanted to solve, okay? The, let me tell you a little bit what these balloons look like, because one, I think it's super cool, and, and two, because it's relevant for some of the things that I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, later at the talk. So the first thing that uh, you have to, to realize is that these balloons are quite big. They are the size of a tennis court uh, when they are in the stratosphere. So they are huge. And the way they operate is uh, they have a fixed uh, volume. And the way they operate is just like a submarine, which also has a fixed volume. And the notion is that you have some lighter than air gas inside the balloon. And meaning that if you just let the balloon the balloon by itself, let's put it this way, the balloon can go up. Then if you want the balloon to go down, uh, to sink, uh, all you have to do is to pump air into the balloon. It has a fixed volume, meaning that now it's heavier for the same volume, it's more dense, and then it sinks. So that's how, how we can uh, operate these balloons, is that by pumping air into this ballast gas, you have the, the, the balloon becoming heavier and then sinking. And then if you open the valve, uh, the, the air goes out uh, and the balloon is going to go up, right? It's just a matter of uh, the same way that submarines work, but then with water. Um, and maybe the, the other relevant piece here is that um, the balloon is carrying a payload where it's like a lot of connectivities and things like that, but it, it's also carrying the solar panels. And this, these balloons are, are solar powered and that's their only source of uh, power. Uh, and that's what we that's and that's the, the the type of balloon that we were controlling. Okay, um, and yeah, and just notice that in this context, if you want to go up, it means that you have to just open a valve. So that's free energy. Let's in a sense, like you don't have to spend a lot of energy to to go up. But if you want to go down, then you have to pump air into this fixed envelope, and then it is uh, it is it does cost power. So unfortunately, I can I do not have pretty videos of real balloons flying the stratosphere because they are between 15 and 20 kilometers uh, high, and it's kind of hard to get cameras there following the balloons. So what what we have like when when you what, but what people do is that you can track these balloons like even in Flight Radar 24 you can you can track these balloons and people do that and sometimes they take. Um, they take pictures, and these are like zoomed in pictures of these balloons in the stratosphere uh, when they're fully inflated, okay? So just to, to reiterate, the problem that we're looking at and what I, is the problem that we call station keeping. 
And the idea is that we have balloons flying in this range between, let's say, 15 and 20 kilometers. And just for reference, like this is way above the altitude that you have most weather phenomena or that airplanes are flying. Uh, so we have these balloons, and the goal is that we're, we, we want the balloon to be inside a region. Let's say you, uh, you, you draw a circle on the ground, and then you just project that all the way to, to, to the top. And we want the balloons to be inside the, uh, a specific region, like of radius 50 kilometers. And all the balloon can do is to go up and down riding the winds, okay, sailing the winds. Uh, what I'm showing you here at the, on the right is just an animation as the balloon goes up. Uh, you're seeing a view from the top of what actually the, the wind current looks like uh, in that particular altitude. So you see that as the balloon is moving, these things are changing. And this also starts to show some of the things that I was telling you about in terms of the high dimensionality, because you see that there is a lot of different pressure levels here. Uh, and also, once you are in a specific pressure level, then you have a whole wind vector to, that to, to consider. So it's, it's, it's quite high dimension. Uh, so that's the problem. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any questions at this point, uh, but my plan now is that is to is to show you how we 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 model this problem as a reinforcement learning problem. Are there any questions of the first part? Okay, I'm going to go on. So this is just the same uh, image as before, uh, but now it's a static and. I just want to go back and emphasize again some of the things that, uh, like not necessarily about the problem, but what makes this problem very difficult from a machine learning perspective. Uh, the first thing is that we don't know the how, like we don't have good wind models, right? Like we cannot just say, oh, I know exactly what the winds are going to look like uh, tomorrow. Uh, so the dynamics are very, very complex. Uh, which is basically mod modeling like things like the weather. Uh, it's very stochastic, and the forecasts are often wrong. Like I'm, I'm giving some references here, but shortly to say is that if you look at some of the forecasts that you can get from like uh, good sources, they sometimes you have forecasts that are 90 degrees wrong or 100 de degrees wrong in terms of the direction of the wind. Now think about it. If you are going to rely on forecasts to to say you're a balloon, and then you get to a specific location, and the forecast is 90 degrees wrong, you're going to, like, not to the direction you want to go, definitely. So this is a first big challenge. The second one is that we don't know what the winds look like at any given point, because we have partial observability. We know what the winds are, where the balloon is, because the balloon has sensors about that, so you know the speed, you know the direction, but we don't know what the winds look like two kilometers above us. Uh, we we might rely on forecasts, but as I said, they are often wrong. So there is a, a high degree of partial observability of what are the winds beyond our surroundings. The problem itself is also quite difficult because it is a long-term objective and it has a binary signal. And what I mean by that is that it doesn't matter for the problem for this problem if you have a balloon sitting at 60 kilometers from from let's say a station. Or 100 kilometers. Both uh, both of the settings, the balloon is simply outside the zone, the, the, the zone you wanted to, to have, and it's just not good enough. So it's a very binary signal because you either are inside the region, and that's great, or you're outside, and then there is nothing much you can do because you're not providing the the, the connection, the connectivity that the balloon should. And there is also the fact that I'm not talking about this for a couple of minutes or even hours. Uh, we were talking about this over days or months, right? So like sometimes you do want the balloon to maybe not take the obvious action that would take it to the region because this is just going to make it pass by, by the region. It's going to serve quite fast and it's going to hinder its ability in the next week to provide internet. So you do have to reason about these very long-term objectives uh, in, in, this, in this very binary setting, okay? Uh, and of course, as you can imagine, there is no stationarity there as well. Uh, the winds are changing all the time, right? So, oh yeah, and, and there's also a, a, another point that is that we also have power constraints in the sense that we don't have infinite energy. The balloons are solar powered. So if anything, you have to be mindful about this because the power that we have is not even used for navigation, but it is also used for other things that the balloon does, communication and so on. 
And not to mention that because it's solar powered, we have to take into consideration the fact that we don't have a sun at night. So when the sun sets until the sun rises again, all we have is what it's in the batteries that were uh, accumulated over the day with the, the, the solar power. So we have to be very mindful about power because if we run out of power, one, there's no communication, but two, uh, the balloon can uh, just like, until, until the sun rises again, the balloon can be blown uh, uh, to a direction that you don't want. And then you wake up on the other day, the balloon uh, has power again. It realizes, oh, I'm 300 kilometers from where I wanted to go. And then I have to go back. And this is something that you also have to be uh, considerate about. Um, the way we did this, because we, we dealt with, uh, we approached this as a reinforcement learning problem, is that we used a simulator to, to train our balloons. And the simulator is probably not the type of simulator you're used to. The problem, one of the problems is that, as I said, we don't know what the winds look like, and we don't necessarily can just uh, say, oh, this is what, uh, this is a good uh, gener uh, generator of winds. So what we do have are, data from the past, that is this data set, era five, which is uh, of what the winds look like in the past. So it's, it is the real because it's what happened in the past. Of course, the past doesn't mean that it's going to happen in the future. Uh, and it's, uh, but the problem is that it's also low resolution. We're thinking about, we're talking about navigating these balloons at every time, like at every minute when we should know the balloons and what the, the, the winds are. And in this case, the, the resolution is much it's much coarser, so we don't know what the winds are in between. So the way we dealt with this problem, like when creating the simulator, was that we upsampled the noise, the the the, the, the winds that we had from the past. Uh, we added some noise with, but we upsampled it in a statistically plausible way to give us a high resolution, and then we effectively have an infinite supply because we can just sample again from that uh, those baseline winds. And we can define a, an episode because we modeled it as an episodic task as the initial conditions of the balloon, where we want the balloon to station over, and a random seed that is going to generate the, the dynamics of the winds. Okay? And the initial conditions mean a latitude, longitude, and altitude, uh, which means like the three coordinates of where the balloon is in the world, and also the time of the day. And from that, we can look at what the winds looked like in the past, and then we can simulate. And this is what. Uh, our simulator looks like and how, how we used it. And we do have a good model of uh, the dynamics of the balloon itself. So it's fairly simple at this point to have that, okay, given where I know where the winds are, like given that I know that the balloon is going up and this is the speed of the wind, I know where the balloon is going to be in the in the in the next couple of minutes. And this and this we can we can model in the simulator fairly well. Okay. Uh, another relevant point here is that the simulator is fairly slow. So the simulator runs at 40 hertz. And just for a point of comparison, when we think about Atari games, that oftentimes people complain that it's already slow to train agents and it takes a couple of days to train. Uh, Atari agents are 200, Atari, the Atari simulator is 200 times faster. It runs at 8,000 hertz. So this simulator is super slow. And there is also this, this extra constraint. Uh, and just to tell you how, we, to give you a flavor of how we get to know the winds, uh, as I was showing, as I was telling you, we start with this baseline winds, which is in the left here in blue, which are, are this weather agency forecast. So the, like they tell us, look, this is what it's going to look like, those winds. But oftentimes they're wrong. And what we're showing here in red is actually what is the measurement that we got with balloons. And then you can see that, yes, it's really bad. And as I, as I said, as I told you, like sometimes you get 90 degree errors. But once we have this, like we have the forecast and once we have the actual measurements, we can fuse those two things. We can, uh, Loon has a, a wind Gaussian process that allows us to fuse these two things, meaning that the forecast become the, the prior. The, we then have the observation, then we can compute the posterior based on that observation. Then we have the winds around us, uh, a much better estimate of what the winds looked around us. And this is a way, this is the way that we use uh, in, the, in our approach to actually keep track of where the winds are. Uh, or what the winds are in this uh, in this problem as we are navigating and we are learning more about the world. Okay, the colors here uh, they are describing what we call uncertainty, which are basically how confident we are of those predictions. So blue means we have very low, uh, uh, we have very high uncertainty because these are just the forecasts, and red means that we have very little uncertainty up to the point that we have zero because we just observed that. 
um, and in, in for the in terms of the uh, in technical terms, this uh, uncertainty is basically the variance of our GP. Okay. So with that, we can then talk about how, once we have the problem and we have like a simulator and we have a uh, a way that we, we can mo we model this, it's a matter of how do we make this into a reinforcement learning problem. Uh, we do this by first we have to define what are the agent's observations, what are the action space, what is the reward function the agent's going to optimize. Just the standard MDP formalism, if you will. Uh, and the observations that the agent has uh, is at the end it's a vector of approximately 1100 uh, entries. This vector has 16 what we call ambient variables, which are just variables describing the state of the balloon. Like, I don't know, what is the time of the day? And what, how much power do I have? Like, these are very uh, concrete um, uh, measures of the balloon. But most of, our, uh, of the observations that we have are actually about the winds. Uh, and this is what the balloon observes. So the way we do this is that we have, uh, we, we look at the column from like the highest altitude from the, the lowest altitude. And we look at the winds across all these columns uh, at different pressure levels. So basically we, we, it's every 50 uh, Pascal that we, that we have a new measurement, which is a fairly uh, fine, uh, fine um, resolution. And then we describe the winds at these different altitudes at, as, uh, with three different numbers. One is the, what we call the magnitude, which means how fast the winds are, the other one is the heading, which is what direction the wind is blowing. Um, and the third one is uncertainty, which is exactly what I was described before, which is, is this, if it's a forecast that we are relying on, the uncertainty is high, but if it's something that we observe, the uncertainty is low. Uh, a last uh, point of interest that I, uh, that, that I think it's relevant to mention is that the way we model this, these balloons are, these this winds, they are centered around the balloon. So as the balloon goes up or down, the, the feature vector also goes up and down in this uh, like in this uh, in this in this in this vector to make sure that the the this feature numbers are always the same for the position of the balloon. So let's say the balloon is this location, so it's always going to be these three features, and then the next three inputs are going to be the balloon, the 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 winds above the balloon, and so on. So it's centered around the balloon. So when the balloon moves around, the features move with it. Okay. Uh, and this is a, a trick that I learned a while ago when we were designing um, shallow features, if you will, uh, for playing Atari games. Uh, and again, being the, having this invariance to the agent, it's it's fairly useful trick uh, in general when designing these reinforcement learning agents. Uh, there are three actions that the balloon can take, which is we modeled it this way, which is to go up, to stay, or to go down. In practice, what this means is that when we say go up, we have the balloon pumping air. We have we have the uh, air being sorry. When we say go down, we, we have air being pumped uh, for a given uh, for a, a given period of time until the balloon goes goes up or down. But we abstract it as just saying go up, stay or down, and everything happens under the hood. And the way we model the reward function was one: if you're inside the region, and if you're outside, and very far it's zero. But actually, if you're right outside, there is an exponential decay with a big cliff. Here on the reward uh, on the reward function for the the balloon, uh, and this was fairly useful for us in the context that it does not only give the the balloon um, the goal itself, but it also gives us a gradient to follow if we're close to the region, and yeah, and this was uh, and this was a useful trick to use here as well. The way we model this problem in terms of algorithms is that uh, we we use the distributional approach, which is QR the QN, quantile regression the QN. Uh, we did this with a deep RL agent, meaning that we had a neural network with seven fully connected layers. Uh, each layer had 600 units. Uh, and we trained these agents in a distributed way. So we had 100 actors uh, training, uh, generating data for, for our learning system. Uh, at the end, it had 1. 1, we used 1.1 billion training steps, uh, which is about approximately a month. Um, and we also, what I uh, you did, what I call purpose for exploration, which is something that I'm really uh, uh, excited about, which is this notion that when the balloon decides to explore, it was not just taking a, a random action like an epsilon greedy way that, as you would expect uh, with epsilon greedy, 
but the balloon would say, oh, I want to go to a specific altitude. And then it would execute an option, if you're familiar with the term. But what I mean by that is just that it was going to take the sequence of actions uh, to take the balloon to that location, then it stayed there until a new action was sampled, either because it's exp exploring again or because it wanted to, to then stay in control uh, and stay in the region. So there was this notion of a this temporally extended exploration that we used here as well uh, to make this work. Okay. Um, and maybe the, the, and this, there is a plot here. I, I haven't talked about results yet, but I wanted to bring this up even before talking about the results uh, and why X is you, you want to be uh, high, which is just to show that we did a lot of uh, careful studies uh, asking the question, do we actually need all of that? Do we actually need seven layers of neural networks? Can we come up, can we have fewer layers? Or if we have more, is, our, 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 is the performance going to improve? Do we actually need distribution RL? And the answer to this question is yes, we need those things. And this, what this ablation is showing is that if we added more layers, we could not make necessarily make the performance improve on the network. But if we had fewer layers, or if we were using uh, not using distribution or the performance was not as good as uh, we had at the end. Okay, in simulation. So that's uh, how we model the problem, and then I can start to the second half of the talk, talk talking about results. But I guess that's now it's a good time to stop and ask if anyone has questions about what I just said. I do have a question about the exploration, Marlos. You you said that the, you were sampling uh, these target altitudes that it would go to. How are you doing that sampling? Were, were you learning some sort of options or just uniformly sampling over the space or how did that work? Uh, we were not learning the options. Uh, we would just randomly sample one altitude uh, and then we would just go there. Like basically, once you know where you want to go, right? Uh, we like because we have a good dynamics of the balloon. It's just in a sense go up or go down. Uh, we are agnostic to the winds in this condition. Then it's basically we just would execute the sequence of actions that you would expect to get to the altitude. But it was uh, uniformly sampled. We were not uh, discovering the target. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Sorry, I have a question. Uh, actually, I have two questions. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. So you said that the actions are meta actions going up, down, or stay. I was wondering why did why didn't you model the action, for example, uh, to how much, uh, uh, whether or not to inject a gas into the balloon? I mean, uh, why didn't you model at a lower level actions? Um, I don't know if I have a good answer for you because, like. We this made sense, and also we managed to make it work. Uh, it, it has some benefits, right? Like we have a small action space. Uh, I I like to make jokes that uh, I when I was doing my PhD, I was uh, spending a lot of time playing freeway, which is just a chicken going up or down to cross the road, and now I'm playing freeway uh, in the in the air. Uh, so it does make sense in the context that well, it allows us to use. It's discrete, so it allows us to use value-based methods, which we're quite familiar with. Uh, it's, it has a small action set, so it also made sense, and we knew the dynamics. So in this context, we yeah, it, it made sense for us, but I don't, I'm, I'm not going to say by any means that if we did the other way, it was going to be worse or anything. This, this just made sense. OK, so you have another question. I was wondering how would you incorporate the constants inherited in the uh, balloon dynamics into the RL framework. For example, balloons cannot move uh, faster than a certain level. So how would you incorporate that constraint into the problem? Uh, I'm not sure I understand your question. So there are some constraints on, their, uh, on moving the balloons. For example, you cannot uh, go up or down uh, higher than a certain frequency in the balloon or move faster than a certain amount, how would you incorporate those constraints into the RL framework? So we, like a lot of those things were built in the simulator, right? Like we know how fast the balloon can go up and it just shows up at the simulator. Like, so you, the, the constraints in a sense, just like the balloon maybe does not even have the ability to do that. Uh, exactly. Otherwise we, yeah. 
there were some things that we wanted to do and we played a lot of with that like oh i don't want the balloon to keep going up and down up and down to stay in the same range maybe we, if all things considered we want the balloon to stay where it is uh and we played a lot with trying to tweak this in the reward function but it's very difficult so at the end most of this it it just the, the natural behavior that we observe just happened because yeah it's it is kind of difficult to add these constraints okay thank you cool thank you are there any other questions I have one question. Uh, could you shed a little bit of light into why distributional RL worked over not using distributional RL? Like what is the fundamental reason why that was helpful in this problem? I I, I want to say that we still don't have a good answer for that. And, and we still don't have a good answer for that, not for this problem. Uh, it is an active research question of like, can we explain why the distribution RL works better than regular RL? Uh, there was a paper at AAAI, I guess, 2020 or 19. Uh, I guess with the pandemic, the years got mixed up, uh, which was suggesting that the distribution RL is doing, uh, performs better than regular RL, if you will, because only with like, theoretically it cannot, it's the same in, even in the linear function approximation. But it's better in practice, empirically, when you have um, deep RL. And the assumption, like, or the conjecture, let's put it this way, the hypothesis that uh, I don't think that we have complete proof for that, is that this extra predicting the whole distribution forces the network to, to predict more things. So it all works almost as an auxiliary task. Uh, but this is a hypothesis, like, it, the fact that we used it uh, comes from empirical experience and say like yes it does work better and then we made sure to revisit and, and see that it didn't but yeah i don't think that there anyone knows the answer the definitive answer for why distribution aura works better uh any other questions or can i move on uh, maybe a quick one yep. um so what's the how's the end of an episode model like what defines the end of an episode Oh yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I forgot to mention this. Uh, and our our simulator was two days long, so we basically modeled forty eight hours because we wanted to capture two day night cycles, uh, and that's it. So we simulate two days of the balloon, and then the episode is over. And then we basically discard the last the last observation because it's a terminal state, and we don't want to use that. Cool. Thanks. That's, yeah. Um, Okay, so so let me move on to first talk about results in simulation, how we got this controller and so on, right? Uh, before I go there though, I just wanna tell you what the baseline is. And what the baseline is actually the control algorithm that was in production at Loom uh, before uh, our deep RL agent. Uh, and it's called the Station Seeker. And it was designed with control, the uh, control engineering principles in mind. Uh, and the idea is that we want the balloon to always go to the center of this region. So if the balloon is always trying to go to the center, you make sure that, well, it's very likely that the balloon is going to be inside the region. And that's what a uh, station seeker tries to do. Uh, it does that by preferring slow winds when it's close to the, the station and fast winds when it's far, because then it can go as fast as possible to, to the region. Of course, condition on the angle. And the idea of the angle is that uh, basically, if you if you can show that if you have an acute angle between where the wind is blowing and the station, uh, basically you know that the balloon is going to eventually end up at the station, like it's going towards the station. And so we are trying to find these acute angles and trying to get there as fast as possible. And once we are in the region, we try to find the winds that are as low as possible. And this is what was being used. Uh, I say we, but I didn't uh, like this was way before we started working with Loom. Uh, this was actually was in production uh, for that, okay? And it has, I think, more than a hundred thousand hours of balloon flight uh, in this controller, and it's uh, and it is uh, it was quite important and useful for loom. Uh, and to just show you that this is not a trivial problem, I'm going to show you what a random walk looks like. Uh, and as you can see here, like hopefully you can see the the, the purple curve, uh, the random walk. If you just uh, let the balloon do, uh, operate randomly, it's never going to be in the region. It's just going to be um, to, to, to be blown away and not be where you would expect it to be. Okay. Uh, and just to, to to contrast with uh, station seeker, so I'm just plotting the random walk 
and the station sticker together, and then you can see that the baseline, which is blue, uh, sometimes it does quite well in staying on target compared to like basically a random walk that doesn't do anything. Uh, it's also interesting to see that sometimes there is nothing you can do, and this is just the nature of the problem. If the winds are not in your favor, uh, there is nothing you can do but uh, wait until good winds show up, and then you, you're just being uh, sailing away from the goal. And maybe you want to sail away as slow as possible for when the winds change. Uh, and let me show you now the RL agent. And what I'm going to show you here, and, and I mean, maybe I should have started with that, but each one of these squares are like different uh, positions or, 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 uh, or days that the balloon was trying to, to, to fly. Uh, and I'm going to, and there's going to be a learning curve when I hit play in the video. And at the bottom, I'm just showing the performance uh, of the random walk uh, here, which is uh, which is uh, pink. And the way we measure performance is what I measure a metric that we call TWR50, which is time within radius of 50 kilometers. This is what it's uh, in the x-axis. So basically, it's the percentage of time that we are inside the region that we want the balloon to be, right? Uh, in blue, we have a station seeker. And in yellow, we have a controller that is a search-based controller that relies on a model in the simulator, but this control is not actually uh, usable in the real world because it, like the model is so wrong that it's, it doesn't do well, but it's kind of a, a nice, kind of an upper bound that we would expect to get in a sense uh, from this control. And as you can imagine, every time that uh, we are showing here the deploy, the, like the checkpoints of different training times, so it takes us six hours to get to the to the to the baseline controller. It takes us a couple of days to get to the search base controller that is not uh, feasible in the real world, and it takes us um, 24 days to get the the final controller that is what we actually deployed uh, in the in, in, in the real world. Uh, and as you can see, like, I don't know, uh, as an RL person, I guess, few things give me more pleasure than seeing a learning curve going up. Uh, and and we see, like, when we are hitting the milestones. And of course, notice that the x-axis is not an up to scale here. It's just showing some important milestones. Uh, are there any questions? No? OK. Um, so. A different way of presenting exactly the same results uh, is this scatter plot because it shows that we actually not, don't care only about the time within radius, which is the how long we are, but we actually care about power. As I was saying, this is a multi-objective uh, uh, optimization problem. And what we did here was, and this is to show you that we did try really hard, given like how a station seeker is set up, to, to tune its parameters to see what are the trade-offs we could get in the baseline. And then you can see this Pareto front that you can trade off power and accuracy, if you will, for the lack of a better word. Uh, the blue one is what was actually in production, but you can see that this is kind of like the best you can expect to get. Uh, and in yellow, again, are like different uh, versions of the search algorithm. And in red, you see a different, in a different, in, in, a, diff, in a sense, it's a, it's a learning curve where you see like the accuracy of the balloon over time. And what you can see, and I think this is pretty cool, is that the balloon with time, it starts to get more accurate, but it also becomes more mindful of energy. And, and the constraint that we had, that we wanted to deploy a balloon that would use approximately the same amount of energy that Station Seeker did. And this is why we ended up using this one, okay? Um, the the just a different way of showing exactly the same results but more with more, uh, more in a more standard way the performance at the end that we achieved was 55 percent 55.1 percent uh while the station seeker had 40 percent and just to, to to remember everyone this is a real problem these percentages have meaning each percent actually means 15 min 15 minutes of, of connectivity uh, so we are actually adding a couple of hours of connectivity by improving from 40 to 55. And the yellow curve, which is the search controller, uh, it's um, it's 51. Uh, these differences are statistically significant. Like all the differences are statistically significant with the proper statistical, non-parametric statistical tests. Uh, but the but again, it's not realistic. And maybe one last thing to to mention is that. 
when we looked at these results, and even when we submitted the paper to Nature, one of the comments that we got was to say that, well, yeah, but is 55% good? Like, we have no idea if this is good. How, how close is this to possible? Is like, Joe Optimo is 100% the best you can get? Uh, so we spent quite some time thinking about ways to actually try to compute what it would be the, be the, me the best you could do in the simulator. And as I said, 100% is not the best because sometimes the wind are not in your favor. You are you you start away from the the region, so you have to go to the to the region you want to serve and all those things. And like I invite you to go to the paper if you want to see details about how we computed this this range. It was a mix of looking at search-based controllers that were cheating in a sense because they had more information, and also looking at the distribution that distribution URL was uh, estimating, and looking at the the right end of the tail and saying that okay this is maybe the best you can do and then we estimated this range we believe it's closer to to the bottom part than to the top all this to say that it's we're getting very close to the best you could do uh even if you had perfect information uh in this in the simulator okay and and maybe the last point about the simulation that it's it's one of those problems that uh it, it becomes way more important when we are talking about uh, deploying this in the real world, is that we do not only want to deploy that, but we want to be able to explain the decisions that these balloons are doing, right? Or at least have some confidence that they know what they are doing. And this and, and this plot is, is actually the, the most complicated plot in the talk, uh, and I'm going to just give you a gist of it. But what we did was to look at the derivative with respect to the... The, we took the derivative of the of the network with respect to the individual parameters because we wanted to see how important it is for the balloon to the, the speed of the wind or things like that, right? And what we noticed is that, uh, and the way you read this plot is that if it's zero here, like how, how numbers above zero is that you are happy when, when this happens and then it's below when it's negative, you are not happy. And what this is showing, maybe as an example, it's easier to explain is that the blue curve, which is the station seeker, which is the baseline, it likes to have, uh, and maybe let me start even with speed, it doesn't like uh, fast winds uh, when it's close to the station. But as it gets, gets further and further away from the station, which is what we are depicting the x-axis, it does like fast winds. Uh, and here, what we're showing is that once it's close to the station, it does like, of course, to the, 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 the angle to, to the angle doesn't matter, but as it gets further and further away from the station, does uh, it wants the angle to be aligned? Okay, uh, and maybe this is a, just a very complicated way of sh of saying that because the station seeker was designed by a human, uh, and we have control theory, like they have control theory in mind when they design designed the design this algorithm, the shape is fairly smooth as you would expect. And then when we plotted this for the deep RO agent, you can see this very nonlinear uh, shapes, like non-smooth shapes in a sense, uh, suggesting that, yes, it's really hard to design by hand uh, this type of control strategies because the network learned things that would be really hard for a human to think about before uh, actually seeing those curves. Uh, so with all that, we have good results simulation. Uh, we had a, a, an understanding of the, what the balloon was doing and, and its general principles made sense. Um, so it was time to actually deploy this in the real world. And I, I'm telling you a lie, as I'm going to show, this process was intertwined, but uh, it's a, it is a good, uh, a good uh, stepping stone. Uh, are there any questions about the results so far? Okay. Yeah, Marlis. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, go on. Power is like, you know, one of the most important factors here. Um, how much power does it take to actually run this deep net compared to a station seeker? Like, is it negligible? So the way it works is that it's not running inside the balloon. So it's running the station and it's just sending the comments to the balloon. So in this context, it's if I understood your question properly, it's not that relevant how much power running the deep net does because it's not running the balloon. So we do have the power at, uh, on, on the ground. Sure, and then the communication like station seeker is also running on the ground. So it's, it's sending the same. Yeah, and then, yeah, and then I don't, I have no idea what the communication profile power is, but then they have a whole stack of things communicating and then we just get to send that information. Sure, okay, cool, thanks. Okay.
Uh, let me move on because I'm, I think I might be behind in time. Uh, so in June of 2019, uh, we had a first trial run in Peru. It was very exciting to see our algorithm actually flying a balloon uh, in the real world. And, we, and this was a very, a, a very basic idea, a basic uh, test that was decided like, well, would it work? Like we have this good controller. Uh, our, our controllers have names of pastas. We can talk about this the other, uh, another time, but th this one is called um, Caneloni, uh, Caneloni 7. And what we could see is that, well, first it was staying target. And even when it was uh, outside the region, as I'm showing you here, it was doing this behavior that yes, we didn't have a right, a, like a straight wind go, going to the direction. So what it did was that it had the stacking behavior that it would just go stacking until it got there, just like you would expect a boat to do. So this was reassuring because we could see that uh, it was doing sensible things even when we deployed. Um, once we did this, it was time to be more serious about evaluation. And when we start to plot Pareto plots of the controllers that we had and the power consumption, we realized that Caneloni 7 was not even the best controller we had. So we spent quite some time fine tuning this and getting the right controller until eventually in October, uh, between October and November, it was three months, we did what I like. I, I really like this expression, uh, A-B test in the stratosphere. So what we got is that we, uh, we took 13 uh, balloons in the real world again, and we stationed them in, in the Pacific Ocean for three months. And well, we wanted to, do, to ask the scientific question, are we actually like, is our, our Perchatelli balloons, this the new controller was called Perchatelli, they actually better than the station seeker. And unfortunately we cannot put two balloons exactly at the same location, let them run. So we had to leave them there for three months to get enough data to, to, for us to allow to answer this in a meaningful way, okay? This test uh, consists of almost 3,000 hours of uh, reinforcement learning flight, flying balloons. And the longest flight was 16 days uh, without any interruption. Um, this is just at the bottom here, I'm showing you the, uh, the final performance. So what you can see is that uh, the RL agent had 79% of time within radios, while station seeker was 72%. In case you're curious, because the performance is better here than in the simulation, it's because the simulator was designed in a way that we have a lot of very difficult uh, situations to assess the, 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 the ability of the balloon to control, to, to steer. And in this case here, it's the real world. So we, we had good wins. Uh, and we were also more power efficient. We were using 29 watts instead of 33 watts, uh, which was also great. Uh, when you look at this, uh, at this plot here, these are the, just two, two paths that these balloons took. It's also interesting to notice that they have a very different flying flight profile. One of the things that you can see is that Station Seeker, which is in blue here, uh, really likes to be in the center, unsurprisingly, because it's what it's trying to do, to always go to the center of, of the, this region. Perchatelli doesn't care so much about the center. It's happy to be in the region because it understands that it's not about going to the center. It's about staying inside this region because the reward function is allowing us to communicate this to the balloon. So it's fairly different. The other thing that you can see it's fairly different is that Sometimes there is ex these excursions outside the region that a station seeker does that in Perchatelli are much, much more rare. And basically, sometimes you have very sharp terms, but it's much more mindful of this region. Again, because it's very aware of the cliff that there is if you, if you go outside the region. Um, all this is not an adopter. We have statistics to justify all the things. This is showing exactly what I said in terms of the distribution of uh, distance to the station that the, that each controller get, uh, stays. And then you can see that we have a peak here while station seeker, it's uh, shifted to the left, closer to the station. And we are also showing here the right, uh, the excursion length, which is um, basically how long it takes once the balloon is outside the region to go back to the region. And what we show here, maybe it's easier to see the inset plot, the cumulative uh, plot is that we always return uh, to the region. We tend to return to the region uh, faster than the than the baseline. So once we are out, we we're trying uh, to return, and we are we do this uh, faster. Uh, the the power profile explains this, uh, and it it is true. And and the reason for that is that when you look at the distance between zero and twenty five kilometers, they kind of use the same power. But when you look at the, the 15 to two, the 25 to 50 kilometer uh, radius, uh, Station Seeker is very aware 
that it's still in a very good position because it, it is uh, where it wants to be, sorry, uh, the learned controller, while the station seeker is still going to try to go to the center. So it starts to use more power than our controller. But on the other hand, maybe because we have more power once it happens, um, the one we are outside the region, then we use way more power, but on average, we are more power efficient. A last result that I want to present to you on, about uh, this, that maybe it's the emergent behavior that I, I, I'm most excited about, is that when we are looking at the average altitude of the balloons, what we notice is that the balloon wanted to be at the bottom at the end of the day which is what I'm showing here, the learned control. And, and then we were asking the low engineers, like, why is that? And eventually they came up with this hypothesis that is super cool, which is, well, going up, because you just have to open a valve, it's free. So what the balloon learned was that, well, at the end of the day, I'm going to lose my main source of power, which is the sun. So I, can, I want to, of course, store as much energy as I can to survive the night and be able to control. But not only that, I can also store potential energy. And I can store potential energy by being at the bottom because then I can just open the valve and then I go up. And this behavior just arose from the learning agent. We never trained it to do this. And we actually had to ask the new engineers what was going on. And I think this is pretty neat, uh, this type of uh, behavior that we observe with our own agents. Um, and just a reminder, this is our re reinforcement learning in the real world. Even though I'm giving a talk with a bunch of simulations, like these balloons are flying, they're providing internet in Kenya using our controller. So this is this is a deployment in the real world. Um, and I'm going to skip that uh, in the interest of time. So just to wrap up, one setting that I'm very excited about is that this problem, in this problem, different than others that we had in the parallel, the environment is much bigger than the agent. The agent cannot think about the the agent cannot think about uh, the weather and try to model everything as on the other hand, if you think about Atari, the network has more nodes than there are bits in the RAM of, of an Atari agent. So this is fairly different, and I think it's a very nice setting to be. And this is actually the type of setting that we that we would expect our reinforcement learning agents to exist uh, when we're thinking about uh, intelligent behavior. Uh, and maybe this is the, the last slide uh, that I'm going to spend. But when I was finishing my... Uh, when I was finishing my, my PhD uh, and I went around to give job talks, uh, people would ask me like, what is your research agenda and what do you want to do? And I remember saying that, well, I want to design algorithms that allow RL to actually be deployed in the real world. And we can, we can actually do things that are using RL for problems that we care about. Uh, and now we can say that, yes, it does work. Uh, of course, there are caveats, right? It works in a specific class of problems, like the balloons do not have to interact with any other objects uh, uh, where they are. There are several safety layers, like if the balloon wants to just keep going up, it can't. Uh, the, there are, we did use a large amount of training, uh, so in a sense it was more like a large-scale distributed dynamic program, but it does work, and it generated a controller that they, they couldn't come up with otherwise. Personally, I learned uh, several lessons that have been very valuable to me. One is that input, like feature engineering still matters. Like what you feed to the network does matter. It's even though there is like, sure, whatever you want to call raw data, you can feed the network and it's going to learn a representation, but getting to the good performance, uh, you still need to be careful about these things. Seem to real and generalization can be robustly achieved. Um, the, there are two things here to mention. One is that of course you have to be careful with your simulator, right? And maybe the main point to mention is that, just as an anecdote, is that we had a, when we started doing this, the balloons would go to the region, then they would just never leave. And we were super excited, like, did we solve the problem? We went to see what was going on. The balloon learned to go to the region and then just go up until the balloon would pop. The balloon pops, it cannot leave the region because it's always there and, and it's all good. But of course, that's not what we wanted. So we had to, to make sure that the simulator was uh, capturing these things. Uh, and also, like, one of the things that I didn't have time to talk about, but I think that's key to this generalization, is this notion of incorporating forecasts and uncertainty into the agent's uh, input. Uh, and this was amongst uh, all sorts of other people who did this. Uh, Craig Shirsten and I uh, wrote a paper and others about this a while ago where we were proposing this idea as well. So it was cool to see this work, and I think it's quite important. Uh, 
and maybe just to not to 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 add the caveat, the, getting the details right in the PRO is quite important. Uh, there is it's not to say that this is a solved problem. Like even things like the rate that you one populates the experience replay buffer matters a lot. For uh, for this, if you if you have too many actors or you have too few actors, the performance is not the same. So it is, it's, it still needs a, a a great level of understanding to use this. But now we know that we can de de deploy this. So yeah, I I I spoke very fast this this last couple of minutes. Uh, this is just to say that our solution is even more robust than 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 the conventional controller, which is other thing that we care about. And what I'm showing here is just in red, uh, we have controllers all side by side, and you would expect that they stay clustered together and they do well when this plot is showing that this is true. Uh, and yes, and I will take questions now if anyone has any questions. And I apologize if I, I'm almost out of time. I have a question, Marlos. Um, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll do the yes, no question first, and then I have a follow up to it. I think I know the answer to the yes, no question. But uh, I assume the balloons didn't do any learning after deployment. Like when you were doing this testing, learning wasn't happening. Or maybe I misunderstood. But what was? Yes, they did not do any learning. <laughs> um, what do you think? Like, do you see that as an opportunity? Um, to improve things, you mentioned this perspective of, hey, here's an example where the world really is bigger than the agent. And often the story that's told around that is, well, you can't stop learning in that case because like you can't really have a full model, a policy that will work in every circumstance. You know, weather patterns might change uh, as you go from summer to winter or something like that. Who knows? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know enough about the domain to, to guess what the non-stationarities would be. Um, do you perceive some and then that's part of the gap? And then if so, what would it take to convince Loon to let it learn on the fly? Uh, yeah, I think that it is a very good idea. I think it's a research question. I don't think that we know, like as a reinforcement learning community, to how do we just add data from a, like a real world compared to the simulator and then we just improve the policy. So I, I totally agree. I think that's, that's an interesting research direction, but I don't think that we have answers for that. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think that Loon, were, they were the best collaborators that we could have uh, come up with to, to, to do like real world around. So they were, all, they were on board with our ideas. So I think that it's just a matter of like knowing how to do those things. Um, and yeah, there are a lot of noise stationers. We did talk about those things because like even the balloons, they wear down with time. So like the balloon is not able to have as much air inside or the battery starts to, to get old. So there is definitely some drift there. And honestly, I was surprised by, by how well we did in terms of generalization and all those things, given so many sources of mismatch. Any other questions? So I've got one. So you, the results you had, um, you, you showed these, these performance results, these improvements, and I'm guessing that those were kind of taken as an aggregate across uh, looking at many di different locations on the planet. Were there particular locations where the station seeker algorithm con consistently outperformed the RL algorithm? Or, or was it just universally that the RL algorithm was good everywhere you tried it? Uh, so we did that. So I didn't explain uh, this, how we, we came up with this metric, but this metrics, the result of like the, in the simulation, the 55% that I was describing, it was the result of simulating uh, 6,000 flights uh, of different conditions and so on, but the flights were always in both Kenya and Peru in our simulation. And then in that, in the, in, in that uh, scenario, uh, the RL agent was always better in both Kenya and Peru. Uh, when we were training, we were training the whole world, but this is a, we, we were not keeping track of that metric, let's put it this way, because then we would have to run the same thing multiple times. So in simulation, we were better on aggregate in both locations, let's put it this way. And the other locations that we looked at, like when we were playing with this, they, we were always better in a sense. The, the catch, of course, that doesn't mean that in every cir circumstance we were better, right? Like they're in the, what we call universe, they're individual uh, settings that the station seeker is better and then the aggregate we are better. Because 
like in the paper, we have a plot, a scatter plot showing that even if we put our controller, I guess that another RL controller that has the same accuracy, it's all over the place because there's a lot of partial observability and stochasticity in the world. So sometimes you just make a bad decision because you don't know it's a bad decision. It's just what you have the information available and it has a long-term consequence. So that's why in this case, it was so important to average those things out because there is a lot of noise in these results. Are there any other questions? Sorry, me again. Uh, I, I guess you said that uh, there might be some uncertainties in weather forecasting. So you, do you think, it, uh, is it possible to model the problem as a hidden Markov process and maintaining some state beliefs for those uncertain conditions? Well, well uh, the, the, the answer is yes, right? Like we could model the problem. Uh, would it work? I'm not sure. Uh, like, uh, it's very hard to come up with, to, to give an answer of like a negative result. Like, it's not possible to do that. Maybe we just didn't do it right or something like that. But because hidden markup process is quite common, but in autonomous navigation, the vehicles. I, I guess, I guess the, the answer that I'm going to use is that scalability is a big issue, right? Like, this is a very high dimensional problem. Um, exactly. And scaling and scaling these things is challenging, right? Uh, I'm not an expert on on, H and, uh, on those things, but even the solutions that we have for partial observable problems, it is difficult to to scale those things. And then you have belief states. And what is a belief state when you think about the whole wind, like the whole state of the the winds in the world? So yeah, I I don't know if this is a satisfactory answer, but this is this is the best I can I can give you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. A quick question about the reward function. Did you experiment with different kinds of reward functions? Like, for example, just different variations of, say, a Gaussian um, peaked at the uh, the the station. Uh, and what what impact did did those have if you tried them? Uh, we did. Uh, this is a plot that we have in the paper. Uh, so basically, we looked at this curve, right? And we had three parameters, which is like the the range here, the peak, uh, the cliff, if we want to have a cliff, and how fast is exponential decays. So in a sense, to this shape of reward, it was fairly robust, as you can see here. Uh, but like, of course, if you had the target bigger than what you actually care about, it was it's not going to be that effective. But it was kind of robust. This is the extent that we played with this reward function. But at the end, because this is a real product, right? Like every percent matters. So we made sure that we we're choosing the best parameter. Any other questions? I realize we are way over time, but yeah. Uh, there is a question. Can you put two balloons for a region? Uh, yes, actually there are. Uh, like even when we were flying those, right? Like we have 13 balloons in the same region. Uh, obviously we cannot have two balloons at this, exactly the same place, but uh, but yes, uh, the idea is to have multiple balloons. And actually this adds another source of uh, like a distribution mismatch, if you will, because the balloons, uh, as I was showing those plots about the winds, um, the balloons, they, once you have an observation, you can update your win, uh, the, the, your let's say your estimate of the world. And once you have multiple balloons in the re in the same region, a balloon that is above you observes a wind, and now suddenly you have certainty. Uh, you are absolutely sure about the wind in two specific locations, up, like where you are and above you. And in the simulator, we never had multiple balloons, so this is a different source of uh, noise stationarity. Uh, and the balloons aware of each other. I, I don't know what it means to be aware of each other like uh they are not reasoning about the existence of other balloons but as i as i just said um definitely the fact that there is another balloon above you for example it, it will change the way you see the winds because suddenly you are certain about that but yeah are, is an agent aware of another agent in the world i think that's a fairly deep question are there any other questions So this is maybe uh, like, so in the beginning, you talked about the weather models and how inaccurate they were. 
Um, and like, I guess most of those weather models are based on like physical modeling, right? Um, and uh, I don't know if this was considered, but do you like, um, like, do you think those weather models could be made more accurate by feeding them the data from your balloons? Uh, because as far as I know, with your current simulations and with your models right now, you're not using that expertise from the meteorological community and other models. Uh, yeah, we are using that only in that specific run, right? Uh, because once we observe it, then we, 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 we update our, our estimate of the world in a sense. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I guess that's way beyond my area of expertise on how they do this. Uh, yeah, intuitively, maybe. But at the same time, I don't know if it's a matter of, oftentimes it's a trade-off between scalability uh, or like how, how like the fact that these models are too coarse, maybe it's because they don't scale. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Uh, maybe I should stop guessing. But uh, yeah, I, I don't have a good answer for you. But it does seem like a good idea. Yeah, makes sense. I guess it's also organizationally hard because that would involve collaboration with, you know, with different customers and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? I do have one more, sorry. Um, I noticed, it, well, maybe it's just the graph that you had. On the learning curve, the, when you got to this 24 hours of training time, um, that it looked like it was still going up. So why why stop there? I know that you hit the same power requirement as the station seeker, but why why stop? Why not go for better? Yeah, it was 24 days actually, not hours. But yes, you're right. I think that's a really good question. And and we did, in a sense, we did. Like we kept training to see it, it and it does uh, flatten out. Um, but I guess the problem is that what we noticed is that, and maybe this was a fear because it, it, it's even hard to do this with a statistical test, that it was the gain in performance was so small, like if you train another 10 days, maybe you're getting 1% out of that. But this is only simulation. And what we start to be afraid of is that the gains were so small that maybe we were, this was the moment that we were actually starting to overfit to the simulator. Uh, so that's why we we chose to deploy the the one at 24 days. Does it make sense? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. If not, let's thanks Marlos for this exciting presentation and answering most of the questions and we will be excited to listen more from Marlos in the future hopefully so thank you everyone for joining uh, today and thank you Marlos for presenting thank you so much thank you for having me sure so see you next week bye bye everyone